everyone and thank you for tuning into this webinar on the topic of redundancy and sex discrimination. My name is Morgan Bryan. I'm a member of the employment group at Trinity Chambers and today I'm joined by none other than Michael Malone. For those of you unaware, Michael sat as an employment judge in Newcastle Employment Tribunal for around 12 years. Michael is now a mediator at Trinity Chambers he provides mediation on a range of subjects from employment to commercial and contractual disputes. And he also provides early neutral evaluation solely in employment matters. Given the increasing backlog at the tribunal, both claimants and respondents may feel that there's a greater appeal going down one of these routes than previously given consideration for. Today, however, Michael is joining me to discuss the various issues surrounding redundancy uh, with a focus on sex discrimination in that context. Uh, we will be highlighting some of the issues that can arise for employers carrying out that exercise and how to potentially eliminate or at least reduce uh, the risk of indirect discrimination on the grounds of sex. Uh, in doing so, we'll be looking at some case law as well as our own experience and particularly from Michael's perspective his experience sitting as a judge in some of the cases we're going to discuss. The main areas that we'll be looking at today are individual and collective consultations, selection criteria as well as maternity issues and we'll briefly have a look at, towards the end of the webinar uh, at ongoing issues that have been caused by remote working and school closures etc how those have an impact on particularly women and the redundancy exercise but before we get into any of those Michael I think is going to kick us off by providing everyone with a brief overview of the redundancy exercise and sex discrimination. Michael, over to you. Thank you, Morgan. Uh, I'd like to start off uh, by just um, looking at one or two aspects of the background uh, in terms of the current um, and emerging economic situation. It's becoming very clear uh, that as we are coming out of lockdown, uh, there are going to be huge numbers of redundancies. Uh, se that, uh, several major redundancies have been announced in these last few days. Uh, British Airways, um, Rolls-Royce, Centrica. Uh, and it's also becoming clear uh, that women are particularly vulnerable in various respects. Uh, for example, um, there's a recent report by the Institute for Fiscal Studies and University College London that of the jobs that have already uh, been lost uh, or people who've resigned from their jobs uh, because of childcare issues, 47% uh, more mothers than fathers are amongst those who've lost their jobs or resigned. There's also been an interesting article in the Times uh, on the 26th of May uh, by Natalie Keeney, um, uh, um, looking back at the 2008 uh, banking crisis. Uh, at that stage, there were growing numbers of women uh, in management and senior management positions, but they tended to be predominantly in the, what were called the non p and roles, the jobs which were directly concerned with profit and loss. HR jobs would be an obvious example, the HR directors. Um, and when employers were retrenching following the banking crisis and having to lose jobs, those non p and jobs were the ones that went first and it was women who were predominantly affected. And the third, I think, the major issue is that um, as hopefully the economy uh, begins to recover, there will be a focus on technical innovation uh, and jobs such as scientists and engineers will be at a premium and sadly uh, already although the number of women um, getting qualifications in STEM jobs have, has been rising very few women have been actually taking up those jobs 
Uh, and so again, they're going to be disadvantaged in that respect. And although uh, there are provisions in the, in the Equality Act permitting a measure of positive discrimination in terms of encouraging underrepresented uh, sexes to, to apply for these jobs and to be trained, that that's very much a long-term measure. So in the short to medium term, women are going to be very much at a disadvantage, quite apart from any questions of direct or indirect sex discrimination. So it's going to be particularly uh, important uh, that employ, not just for their own sake, but for society generally, uh, that employers take the utmost care to avoid any direct or indirect sex discrimination in the way they bring about redundancies. So, Morgan, if I go back to you to talk uh, um, uh, about individual consultation. Certainly, thank you, Michael. Uh, I think you're right. Uh, in climates such as this, where there are large scale redundancies taking place, uh, that inevitably brings with it a, a greater risk of sex discrimination. And one way to avoid that in the case of an individual consultation, and this would uh, often apply to the smaller scale business uh, and bearing in mind the context of a redundancy that the fundamental issue is always one of fairness. Uh, what can an employer do? What are the risks and requirements for an employer conducting an individual redundancy? First point to note is that there's no formal requirement on an employer to conduct a consultation in an individual case. That said, it is rare for an employer to show that dismissing in the case of redundancy is fair in the absence of such a consultation it would be particularly unusual. Assuming, therefore, that for pragmatic reasons, an employer does entail to consult individuals, what must that consultation process actually involve to ensure it is fair? Well, I, again, the most important requirement bearing in mind that require that issue of fairness is that there must be a genuine consultation exercise it cannot just be held in name only and that genuine consultation exercise must of course give adequate time for the employee to respond as well as consider the information and also of course give adequate time for the employer to consider their response that they have received the reality is that in any individual consultation exercise, the focus is more likely to be on alternative areas for employment in the workforce, allowing the employee to put forward their own suggestions as to how the redundancy can be avoided or other suitable means of work that they can undertake. But in every case where that consultation takes place, the employer should listen to the employees and as well as providing an individual consultation, employees should also have the opportunity to contest and appeal the decision made. A very recent example of both these issues regarding individual consultation and the right to contest was seen in a case, apologies for my pronunciation, it's Gwened Council and Shelley Barrett, and that was a judgment of the president of the EAT. It was only handed down a few weeks ago. And the case in so, excuse me, the case itself involved two teachers at a school which was closing. A new school was opening. Both teachers applied for positions at the new school, which were very similar to ones that they were doing. Uh, and this is a scenario we are likely to be seeing a lot of uh, in the current climate. Uh, but in Gwynedd, uh, both teachers were unsuccessful in their applications and they were subsequently dismissed on the grounds of redundancy. Uh, the Employment Tribunal held that those decisions were unfair and the respondent uh, appealed. And even though it was held that there was no issue with the selection process uh, for the new job that was held to be fair, the dismissal itself was still unfair and the reason for that was largely due to the absence of an appeal process or any consultation process about the ensuing redundancy. Uh, the EAT accepted that there was no mandatory requirement for an individual consultation or, as it happened, for an appeal procedure, but the failure to provide both in that case uh, rendered the dismissals unfair. 
the nub of Gwynedd and other cases concerning individual consultations is that regardless of the size of the employer, uh, they are asking for trouble if they fail to undertake a genuine individual consultation exercise. And in doing so, they are likely to alleviate any risk of discrimination on the grounds of sex or any other discrimination for that matter. And those are some of the, the main issues that arise in the context of an individual consultation. There are slightly more uh, issues to be taken into account in collective consultations. And Michael, I think you are going to talk us through them, um, particularly with your unique perspective in a few of the cases. Yes, Morgan, thank you. Yes, the statute law um, on collective consultation um, goes back to the Trade Union and Labour Relations Consolidation Act of 1992, sections 188, 188A and 189. And in short, the, the principle is that if an employer proposes to dismiss on grounds of redundancy 20 or more employees at one establishment within a 90-day period, then there's a duty to give information to and consult with union or other employee representatives. And um, if it's proposed to, uh, to dismiss um, 100 or more employees uh, on grounds of redundancy, uh, then the consultation must begin at least 45 days before the first dismissal takes effect. If it's between 20 and 99 proposed redundancies, it's at least 30 days. And the, the rules are that the consultations must begin in good time. They must begin at, at a stage when the proposals are still formative, when they can still be influenced by the consultations. And they must take place with a view to reaching agreement. The employer mustn't just uh, go through the motions. And under section 189, if um, the um, employer fails to comply uh, with these obligations, then the tribunal can make a protective award, the, the effect of which is uh, that um, the employer is required to make payments, uh, to pay wages to the dismissed employees for a period beginning on the date of the first redundancy dismissal and the protective award period can be anything up to 90 days um, and then there are provisions for a special defense if there are special circumstances which mean that the employer can't fully comply and there was a Newcastle case um, some years ago um, chaired by one of my colleagues um, the Susie Radon Limited and the GMB um, in which um, the employer proposed to close a factory at which there were more than 100 employees and totally failed uh, to comply with the um, statutory requirements for consultation. Uh, but, it, but it was inevitable that the factory was going to close. There was no possibility of alternative work because the employer didn't have any other establishment in the UK. Um, all the individual unfair dismissal claims failed because uh, there was nothing that could be done to avoid dismissals or find alternative work. And it was argued on behalf of the uh, employers uh, that in these circumstances, uh, because the collective consultation um, requirements uh, and the protective award provisions were compensatory, um, then there was no need to, to, to make any, uh, pr pr any protected award. And the case went to the Court of Appeal and they said, no, that's wrong. The, the provisions aren't compensatory, they're penal. Uh, the purpose of these provisions is to deter employers from simply carrying out redundancies without proper consultation with the uh, employer, uh, with the trade unions. And they therefore upheld um, a protective award for the full 90 day period. And the fact that the employees were going anyway and lost their unfair dismissal claims was nothing to, nothing to the point. And then 
in 2006, um, when I just started sitting full-time and salaried um, in, in Newcastle, uh, I chaired the tribunal uh, in the case of the National Union of Mine Workers against UK Coal Limited. And the, that case concerned Ellington Colliery, uh, which was the last remaining uh, deep mine in the northeast. Uh, it it um, ran out for five miles under the North Sea and was known as a wet pit, but there'd never been any serious flooding problems. There were 320 odd employees there. And at the beginning of 2005, uh, UK Coal had been considering for some time whether they should close the pit on economic grounds. But then water started getting into the pit. Uh, that was being controlled um, and um, for quite quickly the pit was at the stage where the water could be cleared within a matter of weeks. Uh, but UK Coal saw this as the opportunity uh, to close the pit. So on the 26th of January, um, they purported to start consultations with the uh, union. At, th at that time, with 300 employees, the required consultation period was not 45 days, but 90 days. But in fact, they dismissed the, the first large batch of employees on the 26th of February, only just over, just over four weeks after they'd started uh, the, the consultation. Um, and uh, eventually the, the two unions involved brought the claims against UK Coal for failure to comply uh, with the regulations. And we found that there was a good economic reason uh, for closing the pit. It was losing money and there was no chance of it getting better. But the UK Coal had said to the unions that they were closing the pit for safety reasons, which was untrue. Um, and um, it was also argued by the unions that there was an obligation to consult, not just about the redundancies, but about the proposal to close the pit, which led to the redundancies. Um, but under the law, as it then stood, the only obligation was to consult about the redundancies. Um, so it was, it was argued by David Reed QC on behalf of the employers that it didn't matter if we found that they told lies about the reason for closing the pit because they didn't have to consult about that anyway. And therefore, although yes, they hadn't given the full notice, but there were mitigating factors for that. And so we should only make a modest, if any, protective award. We weren't impressed by that argument. Our view was that if the employers had lied about the reason for closing the pit, which in turn led to the redundancies, then there couldn't be any proper uh, consultations based on that dishonest start. Uh, and, and we found therefore that um, UK Co were not just in minor breach, but in total breach of the statutory requirements. There had been some attempts to find alternative employment for some of the men, particularly the apprentices, but those had been largely individual managers under their own steam and not involving the unions. So we made a full award, uh, a, a protective award of 90 days, which meant that from the 26th of February, when the first redundancies took effect, um, UK Coal had to pay all the uh, employ employees affected for a 90 day period. Um, they appealed to the Employment Appeal Tribunal. Uh, they upheld us on, on the point that you couldn't have genuine consultations based on a lie, but also they allowed a cross appeal that said, in spite of earlier EAT authority to the contrary, um, there was a requirement to consult about the economic decisions leading to the redundancy as well as to the redundancies themselves. Um, now, that, that particular part of the EA decision has, has been a contentious one, uh, but it still stands as a binding decision of the EAT. Um, there was a case involving the United States Army, uh, which was referred to 
um, the European Court of Justice in 2014 to consider whether European law required consultation about the economic reasons for the redundancies. Uh, but the ECJ ducked the question. They said they didn't need to decide because as far as they were concerned, the relevant directive didn't apply uh, to, to the American army. Uh, and, and therefore they refused to answer the question. So the current position is uh, that decision of the EAT in 2007 is still at the EAT level a binding authority uh, that there's an obligation to consult about the economic decision to, leading to redundancies as well as the redundancies themselves. So Morgan, if, if we go then to the question of the selection criteria, which I think you're going to speak about, aren't you? Thanks, Michael. Uh, much like the consultation requirements, um, getting the selection criteria right is paramount to the issue of fairness in redundancy. Uh, and it's probably in the selection criteria where there is the greater risk of indirect discrimination on the grounds of sex. Uh, that being said, it is important to note that employers do retain a fairly wide discretion over the criteria that they adopt, um, the test being one of whether the criteria adopted was within a range of reasonable responses band. Um, the general rule is that any selection criteria ought to be objective. Um, it is therefore no longer suitable or allowable for employers simply to rely on a manager's view that employee X is a good company man or employee Y is going to bring lots of value to the company moving forward. They need a little bit more than that. They need criteria that are objective and capable of being assessed objectively. As well as having selection criteria that are objective, it is of equal importance that the employer assesses them in an objective way. It's no good having the criteria down on paper, but again, going back to uh, a subjective view uh, on, the, on the basis of one manager's view on certain employees. Um, they are allowed a degree of subjective input, but provided that is with the caveat that the overall criteria are objective and that they're assessed objectively. And um, one criteria uh, was uh, used frequently in the past, but which is now being ushered out, certainly ushered out as a, a single criteria to be used on its own accord, is the last in, first out criteria. Uh, the risks of that were, were are still obvious in terms of age discrimination, and that can be seen in the Court of Appeal case, Rolls-Royce, PLC and Unite the Union. It was a, a little bit unusual in that both parties made an application, a Part 8 application, to the High Court to confirm whether the use of selection criteria, or certainly the use of a length of service criteria, among others, uh, was uh, sufficient and certainly not discriminatory. Uh, that went to the Court of Appeal, and the Court of Appeal, on the basis that it was a Part 8 application, uh, adopted a more stringent uh, interpretation of this statute than the employment tribunal would have done when looking at all the factors um, concerning the issue. But ultimately the Court of Appeal held that a, a provision in a collective agreement under which the length of service was one of several redundancy selection criteria was not contrary to the age discrimination regulations which were then in force. Um, however, the reasons were that it was not the sole criterion and it was not determinative. It was a term of a collective agreement and it was apparently opposed, it was sorry, not apparently opposed by the younger workers. It follows that relying wholly or mainly on a length of service in a redundancy selection exercise would be to risk age discrimination claims. It would also, uh, we feel, undoubtedly risk sex discrimination claims, particularly in employers where they have uh, a large uh, female workforce who have had care, childcare issues, or who have simply taken time away from their workforce um, from, on maternity basis, or have joined later than their male counterparts due to childcare. And, for that reason alone, if an employer was attempting to adopt a last in first out policy in this day and age, as well as risking age discrimination, they are now likely to risk claims of indirect sex discrimination. 
a more glaring example, which is uh, fortunately a, a more dated case uh, from the EAT, is that of Dilophone and Butt. And I simply highlight this to show that any redundancy exercise where the employment tribunal found as a fact that the selection process was influenced uh, by the claimant uh, being pregnant was uh, discriminatory. And that, as I say, was some time ago, but it does serve to illuminate the various risks that are there for employers when conducting this exercise and when adopting any or when adopting the selection criteria. And, and on that subject of pregnancy and the risks therein, Michael, I think you're going to take us or talk a little bit further, and um, particularly regarding the maternity and parental leave regulations. I want to speak first of all about Regulation 10 uh, of the uh, Maternity and Parental Leave Regulations of 1999. This is the regulation uh, that says that um, if an employer uh, is proposing to um, dismiss a, a woman on grounds of redundancy during her maternity leave uh, and terminate her contract on that ground, uh, then she must be offered any suitable alternative post. And in uh, the case of Sefton, Bury Council and Wainwright, uh, Mrs Wainwright was the head of overview and scrutiny uh, for the council, whilst a uh, Mr Pierce uh, was the head of member services and the council needed to affect economies and what they proposed to do was to delete both those posts and create a new post of democratic service manager and this decision was made in July 2012 at which time Mrs Wainwright had been on maternity leave for some months and was still on maternity leave. The council carried out a completely fair selection process, interviewing both employees for the new post of democratic service manager. Um, and they decided that although they were both qualified, uh, Mr. Pierce was the stronger candidate and they offered him the post. Um, and still during um, Mrs. Wainwright's maternity leave, um, gave her notice on grounds of redundancy, uh, which expired in April 2013. Uh, now, she then brought an unfair dismissal claim and relied on Regulation 10, saying that she should have been offered uh, the new post because she was on her maternity leave. The, the council said, no, that, that's wrong. What Regulation 10 is referring to is alternative posts. Once she'd failed to be appointed to the new post, she was put on the redeployment register. And yes, if there'd been suitable vacant posts, she'd have had the first option for one of those posts. But that wasn't the situation. This new post was being created to replace, to, to replace her post. And if, for example, she and Mr. Pierce had been doing the same job and there'd been criteria to decide who should stay and he got the job, then there'd be no question of, him having to go on her staying. But the Employment Appeal Tribunal said no. Um, once the council had decided to create the new post of head of democratic services, that that was then a vacant post. And when they decided to delete Mrs. Wainwright's post, that, that was then a vacant post to which she had to be, um, which she had to be offered. So although she was deemed a stronger candidate, because it was a suitable post for her, it should have been offered to her, and therefore her dismissal was automatically unfair. But then, a few years earlier, um, there'd been a case involving Eversheds, um, where t um, the, the claimant, Mr. De Brillin, and another solicitor, Mrs. Reinholz were both associates at the Leeds office and both in the same team uh, and it was, it was necessary to select one of them for redundancy. Uh, she was on maternity leave at the time when uh, the criteria were being applied 
And Evershed's went to great lengths to have a fair selection criteria. There were a number of objective criteria and points could be um, um, allocated under each of the criteria. Uh, the only problem was one particular uh, criterion was what they call the lockup time, the length of time uh, between work being done and being uh, paid for by the client. And there could be 0 0.5, 1, 1 1.5 or 2 points on that particular criterion. Uh, and that was being assessed as at the end of July 2008. At, what, at which stage Mrs. Reinholz was on her maternity leave and therefore there was nothing to assess in her case. So the, they arbitrarily gave her the maximum of two points, whereas Mr. De, De Berlin only got 0.5 points. So because of that, he finished up uh, with, with his total score 0.5 points less than hers, and he was the one who had to go. And uh, again, that case went to the EAT. And they found that what had happened in that case was direct discrimination in favour of her and against the male claimant. Um, and that was because there could have been other ways um, of, of assessing the relevant criterion. Um, that they could, for example, have looked at the position immediately, immediately before her, her, she started her maternity leave. And at that stage, they would have had the same points under that criterion, and the total points would be more for him uh, than for her. And um, it was argued um, on behalf of uh, the employers uh, that um, th there was a provision in what was then the Sex Discrimination Act, now in the Equality Act, uh, that there's no unlawful discrimination where special measures are taken um, to, to protect employees. Uh, on grounds of pregnancy or maternity, and it was argued that that applied in this case. Uh, but the EAT said no, it's only measures taken which are reasonably necessary uh, to overcome any disadvantage caused by the pregnancy or maternity uh, that, that apply in those cases. Um, um, and therefore, the, even though uh, Evershed's had taken great care, and thought that they were doing the right thing to avoid disadvantaging the woman on maternity leave, it was found that they had unwittingly um, discriminated directly against the claimant and his claim uh, succeeded. Um, now, so, so far as that particular section is concerned about the special measures uh, for pregnancy and maternity, uh, there have been two very recent cases um, in which it was argued that the effect, um, it was argued on the basis of the Evershed's case, uh, that those particular provisions can only ever apply if they're proportionate. And it was argued in two cases by male claimants uh, that it was disproportionate uh, that a, a man taking parental leave uh, should receive lower pay during the parental leave period uh, than a woman taking maternity leave for the same period. And it was argued on the, on the basis of the Evershed's case that it was disproportionate uh, for the woman to receive a higher payment because it effectively both the maternity leave uh, payment, certainly what, after the baby had been born, and the parental uh, leave payment were both for childcare. Uh, and that went, to those two cases, uh, Capita, uh, Customer Management and Alley, and um, Chief Constable of Leicestershire Police and Hextall, both went to the Court of Appeal, and, and they said, no, that's wrong. So far as those provisions are concerned, those provisions for uh, the, the statutory payments for maternity leave or any contractual payments uh, for maternity leave are paid uh, because, to protect the woman during her maternity leave and not just for childcare. So it, that there's no comparison uh, between parental leave payments and maternity leave payments. So, so the principle of the Evershed's case is limited to that very narrow area of uh, application selection criteria. So, so I think now, uh, Morgan, you've got a number of um, separate points to pick up on.
Yeah, I think, um, thanks, Michael. Just touching upon uh, what you started talking about and the fairly damning statistics uh, that have come out about the number of mothers who've been redundant and, uh, and also with the comparison to the 2008 crisis. And um, truly, we feel that one big area that employers will have to consider now and particularly in light of school closures is the ability of women who are still uh, more often than not uh, the primary carer and the ability of those women to return to the workplace if ultimately that uh, is used in conjunction with selection criteria in a redundancy exercise or for that matter any other and um, particularly uh, aspect of employment and um, there is a risk of indirect discrimination um, and also uh, in the climate of the pandemic, lockdown and businesses having to adapt to remote working and um, a lot of those adaptions in giving parents greater leeway in terms of remote working and hours of work um, may need to become a fixture, a permanent fixture in order to avoid the risk of sex discrimination moving forward. Um, and there, there is, of course, the added risk, and Michael's touched on it there in terms of the Evershed case and Ali and Hextel, in that where businesses do make special arrangements for female workers to allow them to continue to provide their care duties, they do now need to bear in mind that there are also men, and undoubtedly more men now than there were in 2008, who, for various reasons, are primary carers and who can now only work from home. Uh, failure to make provisions for one whilst making provision for the other sex again is likely to lead to potentially direct discrimination claims. Um, one positive side that employers can take away from this fairly glum news uh, and a lot of risk that we seem to be giving them is that where businesses are slimming down where there's a lot of reorganisation taking place at present and um, there's a possibility that virtually every job in a business will be changed to some degree and that is a, a perfect time to adopt and adapt a job evaluation scheme if there isn't one in place which will avoid or certainly reduce the risk of equal pay claims and moving forward for that pre-job evaluation scheme period and there are a number of issues that employers have to consider and um, both in the context of redundancy sex discrimination and those issues are changing almost on a daily basis and um, my god i think those are the main issues i just wanted to flag up i think i'll pass them back to you and um, to conclude this webinar thank you morgan i certainly endorse what you said just then about it being a good time to consider job evaluation um, when I was sitting in Newcastle, we had a huge number um, of NHS equal pay claims and in 9,000 of those cases, the claimants weren't complaining about the new job evaluation scheme. They were quite happy with that. What they were saying is I'm now uh, on the same level as Mr X. Previously, I was paid less than him and therefore I've got an equal pay claim going back six years. Um, and some of those claims succeeded, some failed. Uh, but um, if the, the main problem that the NHS had with those cases was, in most cases, the job hadn't changed, it was just a new grading system. Where an organisation is being completely uh, reorganised uh, and the, the, the new jobs are very different from the old jobs, then it's very difficult for employees who've done well on their job ev evaluations then to use that as the argument for bringing back pay claims. Uh, so I, I think, Morgan, that covers the points we wanted to talk about. If anybody uh, has, has any further general uh, questions arising from what we've discussed, both Morgan and I will be very happy to answer them to, to, to the best of our ability. And our email numbers will be flagged up on the screen together with the various case references uh, with the case we've talked about. Uh, if any of you have any specific issues, uh, cases you need advice on, a representation, uh, then Morgan and the other members of the employment team uh, can be contacted through the clerks. Uh, I'm not able to take on individual cases because it, it was part of, it, it was an understanding when I retired 
that I wouldn't suddenly turn up in the tribunal uh, arguing cases that could, could cause embarrassment all round. Um, so my, my, my role at Trinity Chambers is for mediation work and early neutral evaluation and not for doing uh, advocacy. Thank you. <laughs>